The Fred Allen Show. Brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. An hour of smiles with Fred Allen, folks. 3,600 seconds of fun and music. Fun with our star comedian, Fred Allen. With our guest, Jack Boyle, the cattle caster at Paramount Studios. Music with Peter Van Seaton, the Mary Mac, and Betty Jane Rose. The time has come. It's the Fred Allen Show. The time, 5 o'clock Pacific Time. The place, Studio B in Hollywood's Radio City. The occasion, the opening of the Fred Allen Program, and the overture is You Can't Brush Me Off. California, some people leave New York by plane, some people leave New York by train, others leave by bus. Tonight we bring you a man who left New York by request. And here he is, Fred Allen in person. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, here we are in Hollywood, Harry. How does it feel? Oh, wonderful, Fred. Say, it certainly seems good to wake up in the morning and find the sun out for a change. Yes, when we left New York last week, you could only see the sun by appointment. Yes. You had to send in 20 box tops or something, <laughs> I forget. Say, what's, uh, what's wrong with your coat, Harry? Your what? coat. Right, oh, oh, that, nothing, Fred. The lapel is gone, that's all. It moths? No, no, the that's... lapel came off in a real estate agent's hand. He oh. grabbed me as I was getting off the train. <laughs> Say, you, uh, don't move around on the left. He's moving on the left. Well, Peter's very nervous, you know. Oh, those musicians, all of it. <laughs> There'll be plenty of dull spots coming up. You can walk around the nose. Fine thing. Now, uh, now we're 12 minutes late already. <laughs> well, uh, uh, what did you say, Harry? How did you lose your lapel? Well, I got off the train and this fellow grabbed me by the lapel right away. Oh, and real I estate. sort of jumped and the oh, lapel well, you were, Say, you were lucky getting a tall real estate agent, Harry. I got a short one. Wait till I turn around. Look. <laughs> Fred! What? Well, I can't help it, Harry. The man grabbed me by the base of the trousers. He was trying to sell me a country seat, he oh. said. <laughs> Well, uh, you didn't take the seat, did you, Fred? The man beat me to it, Harry. <laughs> well, I was lucky my lapel came off and I was able to get away. Say, I'll say you were lucky, Herschel. I was pulled all over North Hollywood in reverse. Did you look at any property? No, Harry. The man had me by the seat of things. I wasn't facing anything he had for sale. <laughs> I did see a couple of escrows flying. Hi, uh, wait a minute. I, I didn't finish the line. That's twice. <laughs> Has the union got an old leader out there they don't want? To... <laughs> Listen, I don't mind you walking on laughs and stepping on laughs when you start to kick them around. <laughs> but the white pants have gone to his head. Why, why didn't you get the coat bleached, too, and come and... <laughs> Well, all right, you can... I did see a couple of escrows flying around. That oh, was Pete. my line. Hi, fellas. Uh, hi, uh, hi, oh, Pete. Pete. Yeah, for the second show. Did you fellas get a place to stop? Well, I'm all set at the hotel, Pete. I'm at the Hollywood Dewey. Uh, the, oh, you mean the Hollywood Roosevelt, don't you, Harry? Well, I'm in the Republican wing. Oh. <laughs> the lobby, hey? <laughs> 
Have you got a Have you got a nice view? Yes, across the street is the theater. Gone with the Wind is playing there. Oh, you've got southern exposure. That's <laughs> well, isn't it? Where are you living, Alan? Well, I've got a room over a bowling alley on Vine Street. It's a spare room they have. Up there. <laughs> I bet you can hear a pin drop. You get it, Harry? <laughs> Yeah, I got it, Pete. And uh, you can have all of it, Harry, too. You can have my share. Oh, Pete, don't mind, Fred. Where are you stopping? Oh, I'm living with friends, Harry. Friends? A band leader has no friends. Just critics and creditors. Oh, no. If it's any news to you, Stoop, I'm living with Phil Harris. Yeah? Well, where's Phil living? Uh, Phil's living with friends, Harry. Well, who, who are Phil's friends? How should I know? I'm living with Phil. He's living with them. <laughs> You mean you haven't made any attempt to get acquainted with these other people? Not me. Why should I mess around with that riffraff? And since I seem to say... Now you can walk, you see. <laughs> and since I feel the same... <laughs> since I feel the same way about riffraff, we leave you to joy, rejoin the hoi polloi, Mr. Van Steeden, and turn to the latest news of the week. Ipana News presents The World in Review. <laughs> Hollywood, California. Prominent comedian arrives in Hollywood to complete radio season and start... Hey, uh, Fred, hold it. So somebody's knocking. Knocking? Why, that's the second largest industry in Hollywood, Harry. <laughs> Come in. Fred Allen? Yes, I'm Allen. My card. I'm from the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Mr. Allen, on behalf of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, I welcome you to Hollywood. The gateway to California, Hollywood. The heart of the world, Hollywood. Hollywood welcomes Fred Allen to Hollywood. The man who blew that fanfare was no musician. <laughs> You're right, Allen. I'm a critic. Uh, how did he get in without opening the door the second time? <laughs> Will you open the door once more to balance the script? Would you mind doing that? Thank you very much. The, as long as we're... As we want to come out even, no sense in coming out with a door opening left over, I mean, after all. Well, we'll get back to the newsreels. Ipana News presents The World in Review. Hollywood, California. Prominent comedian arrives in... Oh, uh, hold it a minute. Oh, what is this? Come in. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yes? I'm Mr. Trent, the official censor here at NBC. Yes? I was going to send you a memo, and then I thought, oh, shoot. Why waste the paper? I'll come myself. You say you are the censor, Mr. Tran? Yes, I've just read your script, Mr. Allen. And hilarious bit of scrivening, eh, Mr. Tran? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I knew it, but what? Certain jokes have been overdone here in California. These jokes about California weather, they're out. But I, These I... jokes about Bing Crosby's horses, they're out. Oh, now, wait a minute. Bing's horses are used to finishing out of the money. But this is probably the first time they've ever finished out of the script. <laughs> and these jokes here about Pomona, they're out. Say, tell me, what is Pomona? I bought those jokes from a California writer. <laughs> is, uh, is Pomona a male Pomona? <laughs> no, no, no. Pomona is a town outside of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. The comedians built Pomona themselves to tell jokes about it. Oh, they did? Yes, yes. <laughs> Good idea. They've been overdoing it. Pomona, too, is taboo. And I do mean boo. Oh. <laughs> now, wait a, wait a minute, Mr. Trent. If I can't mention the weather, Bing Crosby's horses or Pomona, how do you expect me to get any laughs? Very simple. You can rent another eagle. I... <laughs> well, I may not have to rent one. A bird may show up during the program. <laughs> Well, I ought to broadcast in an alley. I'm sure I'd meet a better class of people. Not Afra members, but I would... They would. Well, I kind of news present. Oh, there can't be many more knocks left than that door. I know. Come in. Go right in, Arthur. Yes, Mother. Stuffy place, isn't it? Oh, no. Oh, what's that? That's Mr. Allen. Oh, good. Hold my hand, Arthur. He may bite. Now, madam, if you're taking the little boy... I know where I'm taking him. Speak up, Arthur. Must I talk to this monster, Mother? The feeling is mutual, son. Now, look, madam, I'm very sorry. I'm busy here. I... Quiet, introvert. Uh... <laughs> Why, Orson here is opportunity knocking at your door. Oh, come, come, come. Let's have no understatement, Mother. Tell 
him who I am, what I've done. I found him, Mumsy. Mumsy will handle him, darling. That child is spoiled, madam. He won't keep until morning. <laughs> I've got dry ice in his BBBs. Well, he uh, may make it, but uh, who uh, who is this Trojan pony you have? Mr. Allen, meet Orson Rooney, the greatest child star in Hollywood today. Orson Rooney? Yes. The critics say I'm half Mickey and half Wells. <laughs> You are all Mickey, as far as I am concerned. Uh, now, listen, who sicked you two Joes on me? You're here to make a picture with Jack Benny, aren't well, you? Well, so what? You two have got to have some talent in the picture. Yes, you're going to need a name. I am a name. You are a name I would hate to be called, sir. <laughs> what have you ever done in picture? Tell him, Mumsy. In 1937, in Bachelor Mother, yes. Orson's one line was the hype part. He said, Be gone, father. You're no father of mine. Straight out. <laughs> in 1938, in Bachelor Aunt, again Orson was a high spot. He said, Be gone, father. You're no father of mine. Straight out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in 1939, in Bachelor Bachelor, Orson said, Be gone, father. You're no father of mine. Straight out. Mm-hmm. You see? Orson's career has been a cavalcade of high spots. Well, up to nine... <laughs> that is only your opinion, madam. Up to 1939. What? Tell me, what is he going to do in 1940? That is up to you. Mm-hmm. Yes, what is it going to be? In 1940, is Orson Rooney hitting a high spot? No, in 1940, Fred Allen is hitting a low spot. Take this. Oh, you beast. Oh, excuse my short leg, lady. I was aiming for the ball. <laughs> I've been so insulted in my life. Let's go. Yes, back out, Mother. Here comes his other foot. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Merry Max. Fred, the Merry Max. What about the newsreels? Well, Harry, we haven't any time for the newsreels now. Oh. According to the studio clock, it's time for the Merry Max to sing for us Ezekiel Saw the Wheel. Gentlemen, if the first four rows will please move back, I'll unleash our first guest of the evening, Mr. J. Stanford Snarlsworth, the Sunshine Boy. Now, a lot of nonsense. Radio, bang. Well, I take it that you don't like radio, sir. I don't like anything. Does that answer your question? Well, are you always as amiable as this, Mr. Snarlsworth? Sure. I got an even disposition, always mad. I bark at dogs and even make faces at babies. Well, I bet that makes you very popular with the women. Women? They're a plate. There's my wife. She always used to greet me at the breakfast table with one of those cheery smiles. Well, I soon put a stop to that. I hate everybody. I even hate myself for being so grouchy. Well, have you any idea what makes you so easy to get along with, Mr. Snarlsworth? Of course not. If 
I had, I wouldn't be this way, would I? Well, then maybe Harry Von Zell uh, might be able to help you out. You think you can, Harry? Well, Fred, I'm afraid not. His sounds like rather an advanced case. But I can help anyone who has an ordinary grouch because he feels sluggish, headachy, and under the weather. I can help those people by suggesting that they take Sal Hepatica. For Sal Hepatica speedily helps you feel your best again. That's easy to understand, too, because this famous saline acts quickly in two ways. First, as a laxative, Sal Hepatica is speedy, yet exceptionally gentle. Second, Sal Hepatica also helps counteract excess gastric acidity, which chases that sickish feeling fast. That is why so many physicians recommend Sal Hepatica, and why millions of people have found it to be an ideal laxative. So get a bottle of Sal Hepatica from your druggist, and simply put two teaspoonfuls in a glass of water and drink it. Soon, head clearing, pep returning, you begin to feel like your old self again when you take Sal Hepatica for a faster comeback. Stephen Bowling. He wants to see if his dandruff will come out, I guess. <laughs> but uh, Peter Van Steeden and his son, Kiss 17, have just played a number called Six Lessons from Madame Lazonga. The librettist apparently wrote himself out on the title, There Are No Lyrics for the Song. <laughs> now, our guest tonight, our guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, hello, Portland. Hello. Well, are you enjoying life here in Hollywood? I'll say. Mama's been taking me around all the studios trying to get me into pictures. No kidding. Yes. Mama said I used to look like Shirley Temple before Shirley Temple looked like Shirley Temple. She did, really? Uh-huh. Well, why didn't your mother put you into pictures then? Well, Mama said nobody wanted anybody who looked like Shirley Temple until Shirley Temple went in pictures. Oh, well, how does your mother expect to get you into pictures now? Mama says now I look like Claudette Colbert. But isn't there a girl using that name in pictures now? <laughs> yes. Mama found that out today. Oh, so has been talking, hey? <laughs> well, watch, uh, watch your... <laughs> Clear Schreiber, somebody. What's her, what's her next move? What's, her, what's your mother's next move? Mama says if I live long enough, I'll look like Mae Rosen. Uh, oh, so? So? I've still got one more chance. Gosh, I nearly blew that line so bad. I can do it from memory. I have a short memory, and it's a short routine. But personally, Portland, I think your mother is semi-askew mentally. You can't be a success in pictures just because you look like two people. Thomas Edison was. Well, how do you mean? As a boy, Tom Edison looked like Mickey Rooney. And? As a man, he's the sitting image of Spencer Tracy. Yes, Edison was sure lucky. He's the only famous man who lived that didn't look like Don Amici. <laughs> Is Don Amici taking your place? Taking my place where? Well, just then he said Sunday night he was putting you out of his picture. Look, Benny can't put out a hot foot. <laughs> Benny can't even get into Paramount today unless Rochester's with him. <laughs> said he was having them tear up your contract. Oh, yeah? Well, whoever tears up my contract is going to have some mighty expensive confetti on his hand. <laughs> if you're going to be together in the picture, why is Jack going to Honolulu? Well, that shows what Benny knows about pictures. Now, our picture opens with a long shot of Benny in Honolulu. He's gone to her going, rather, to Honolulu for the long shot. He doesn't even know they build sets in studios. <laughs> What is a long shot in pictures? Benny. 
He hasn't been in Dennis Day is clapping under protest. He's... <laughs> you know what happens, Dennis? You're through as of that last, uh, uh, two, that last decibel disturbance there. But uh, enough about uh, Benny, Big Baby Sandy, as we call him around North Rockford. Eh? Tell me, who is our guest tonight? He's the man who casts all the horses and cattle used in Paramount <clears throat> pictures. Oh, he's a cattle caster, hey? That's right. Mr. Allen, meet Jack Boyle. Well, good evening, Mr. Boyle. Good evening, Mr. Fred. Uh, uh, Allen, yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are different doors in the studio. I mean, this is the Allen program, Mr. Boyle, in case it comes up later. Well, good. Uh, Portland tells me, Mr. Boyle, you know, people with all these doors walk in and get on the wrong program, you know, and then wonder why they're not paid off in later life. But Portland tells me, Mr. Boyle, that you are a prairie talent scout for Paramount. Uh, that's right, Fred. I've been supplying Paramount pictures with horses and cattle for 16 years. Well, yours is certainly an unusual profession, Mr. Boyle. How did you happen to take up this career as a stockyard salesman? Well, Fred, I started out... <laughs> I started out in 1923 as a cowboy actor. I soon uh, saved enough money, so I went into this business. Oh, you mean you preferred renting animals to being a movie actor, Mr. Boyle? <clears throat> it's a lot safer, Fred. Uh, wait a minute. Was this, uh, Mr. Boyle's throat cleared before we went on? <laughs> <laughs> if it was, you won't have to bother with it again. <laughs> well, did you say it's a lot safer? The horse never becomes box office poison. Oh, how right you are. <laughs> well, tell me, Mr. Boyle, for what big pictures have you cast the cattle? Well, there uh, was Wells Fargo, The Plainsman, Bo yeah. Jess, Union yeah. Pacific, and I just finished working on a new Cecil B. to uh, mid the mill picture, Northwest Mounted Police. I supplied almost a thousand horses. A thousand horses. Well, isn't it rather complicated being the manager of so many equine thespians, Mr. Boyle? Well, how do you mean, Fred? Well, for instance, how does a horse's agent collect his commission? <laughs> Now, after an equine player has done a day's work, you, as his agent, can't stick your head in the horse's feed bag and eat 10% of his oats. <laughs> or can you? Uh, not exactly, Fred. <clears throat> I'm paid by the company according to the work the horses do. Oh, you mean different horses have different salaries? Well, that's right. An ordinary movie a horse gets $5 a day, but a trained horse gets $100 a week. Well, that ain't hay, <laughs> is it? <laughs> but I guess the horse wishes it was. But tell me, does preparing... Ho uh, we'll wait, I mean, if anything... <laughs> Just give us a signal. Always happy to apply. But I am... <laughs> but tell me, Mr. Boyle, does preparing horses for camera duty uh, present any special problems? Yes, horses are the same as, uh, as movie stars, Fred. They require makeup. Mm -hmm. They have doubles to stand in. And some of them even go Hollywood and try to steal scenes. You have horse hams, too, do you? <laughs> well, tell me, how do you make horses up? Well, making up a horse usually consists of dyeing it another color or some harmless solution. Dyeing it? You mean that the horse the Lone Ranger has been riding around all these years is in reality a peroxide blonde? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about silver, Fred, but I have to make up animals in a lot of my pictures. Well, do you have character horses to play old man stallion? <laughs> you know, do you line their faces and stick gray manes on them, do you? I uh, know, but sometimes two stars will ride horses that look almost alike. We change their markings to avoid confusion. Oh, well, do you do anything besides dye the horses? You know, do you put red enamel on their hooves, pluck their fetlocks, or give them an upsweet tail do? <laughs> uh, sometimes, Fred. But, uh, you say... <laughs> But you say horses have doubles and stand-ins, Mr. Boyle. Now, what does a horse with four legs need with a stand-in? A horse that's ridden by a star is too important to be risked in jumps and falls, Fred. We make up other horses that look like him for action shots. You haven't got to catch a train or anything. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a quickie we're making. <laughs> we got time. We got 35 minutes yet. But you say you make up another horse to look like the, the uh, star's horses for action shot. There's more to this horse business, I can see, than meets the eye. Now tell me, what about cattle? Well, cattle are much easier to handle than horses, Fred. Well, what about those herds of cattle you use in prairie scenes? Now, what becomes of these cows when you're finished with the picture? You just send them around to central casting, do you? 
No, I sell the herd back to the meat packers. Oh, you mean the steak that I ate in the drive-in this noontime might have been playing opposite Hopalong Cassidy yesterday? <laughs> it's possible, Fred. Well, isn't it rather risky leaving a herd of steers around loose on a Hollywood lot, Mr. Boyle? Well, how do you mean, Fred? Well, haven't you ever caught an actor bearing down on a fat steer with a knife and fork, calorie bent? <laughs> uh, not yet. Well, I heard about one picture they were making for some independent company around here. The director was taking a close-up of a cow's head. Well, when he pulled back the camera... The rest of the cow was gone. <laughs> the cast had eaten the cow right up the backbone to the collarbone. <laughs> but I imagine you come across some odd problems in your business, Mr. B. Yes, I occasionally do, friend. What would you say has been dilemma number one in your 16th cinematic year? I guess it was in connection with the picture, A Book Benny Rides Again. Yeah, there was another problem connected with that. <laughs> you, uh, what was, uh, what was your problem? This was keeping Jack Benny on his horse. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> now we are getting someplace. <laughs> Confidentially, Mr. Boyle, how did you keep Benny in the saddle? Did you use new skins? <laughs> <laughs> well, Fred, it was pretty hectic. They tell me what happened when Mr. Benny confronted his mouth. Well, Mr. Benny looked at the horse, and the horse looked at Mr. Benny. Then the horse started to walk off the set. Yes, there are some things even a horse won't stand for. <laughs> well, Mr. Boyle, I imagine Paramount will be sending for you soon to work in the new Jack Benny picture. Are they using horses in this one too, Fred? Well, not that I know of, but when the picture's finished, the publicity department may refuse to rave about Benny's work, and that is where you will come in, Mr. Boyle. But I'm just a horse and cattleman, Fred. I know, but you can provide the necessary book. Oh, I get it. Good night. Good night, and thank you, Mr. Jack Boyle. <laughs> Miss Betty Jane Rhodes heard that we had to leave Wynn Murray in New York to keep an eye on the World Fair. And so, Miss Betty Jane Rhodes has kindly volunteered to save what's left of the day. Her song, Exactly Like You. <laughs> Thank you. 
ladies and gentlemen, the radio and the newspapers and magazines are so full of contests lately that I'm sure you'll all be interested in our next guest. One Mr. Joseph Dokes, habitual contest winner. Mr. Dokes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Allen and fellow contestants. Thank you. Is it true, Mr. Dokes, that during the past week you have won a telescope, a honey bear, and a set of dishes in contest? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Allen. Well, I understand you won the telescope in a contest sponsored by the I Spy Eyeglass Company. Now, would you mind telling us what your entry was? Uh, no, indeed. My entry was, I like I Spy Glasses because they are the best. Well, that was certainly <laughs> a bullseye. Now, about the, the honey bear. Uh, that contest was sponsored by Prometheus's Pretty Pretzels, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And my prize-winning slogan for that was, I like Prometheus's Pretty Pretzels because they are the best. Oh, you're, <laughs> you're certainly so consistent, aren't you? Now, if the makers of Sal Hepatica were to run a contest... I'd say, I like Sal Hepatica because it is the best. Punch, you must. <laughs> but why would you say it is the best? Well... I don't know. <laughs> well, if you don't know, then you couldn't find a better man to tell you than Harry Von Zell. Harry, please. <laughs> well, Sal Hepatica is ideal to take when you feel sluggish, headache, and need a laxative. Because this famous sparkling saline gives you a faster comeback. In the first place, as a laxative, Sal Hepatica is quick-acting, yet very gentle. In the second place, Sal Hepatica also helps counteract excess gastric acidity, which chases that sickish feeling fast. So, ladies and gentlemen, get a bottle of Sal Hepatica from your druggist and simply put two teaspoonfuls in a glass of water and drink it. See how soon you feel more alert, alive, more like your old self again when you take gentle, quick-acting Sal Hepatica. The Fred Allen Show will continue immediately following a brief pause for your station identification. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the question of the week. This is Mr. and Mrs. Average Man's Round Table, where three persons selected from our studio audience are invited to give their opinions on a question that concerns some prominent issue of the day. These little sessions are entirely unrehearsed. Fred is taking his place now at the round table, yes, where he meets Harry. his fellow debaters for the first time. Yes, Harry. Are you prepared, Fred? <laughs> yes, Harry. All right. I'm prepared. Good evening, good evening, good evening. The uh, uh, forum is officially open. If Portland will kindly uh, introduce the first member of our little committee here. Yes, Mr. Victor Woke from New York City. Well, good evening, Mr. Woke. Good evening, Mr. Woke. Oh, excuse me, I guess it's still afternoon here in <laughs> California, isn't it? But uh, uh, tell me, you live in New York City, do you? That's right. Well, what are you doing out here in California? Did you get on a wrong bus at 42nd Street or something? <laughs> no, not quite. I'm uh, a graduate student at the California Institute of Technology. You are a graduate student at the California... Well, if you live in New York City, wouldn't it be more convenient for you to uh, go to college in New York instead of going to the University of California? Or are you commuting? <laughs> Uh, no, the uh, California Institute is a particularly excellent school, as Milliken would say. Oh, as Milliken would say. <laughs> Claire Milliken, somebody. <laughs> that but, won't go on in the second but, show. But right tell, me, tell me, uh, 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 what are you studying that, is, that, that makes, it so, uh, makes it imperative that you come here to California to study, Mr. Wolf? I'm uh, in the electrical engineering department, and I'm working in the high-voltage laboratory. In the high-voltage laboratory? Yes. Uh, are you working on any particular problem? Uh, at present, no. You uh, aren't? No. But what are you doing? Isn't that, uh, isn't it pretty dangerous to be in a high-voltage laboratory if you're not doing anything? <laughs> Are you working on some problems, aren't well, you? Well, we're getting ready to attack some new problem now, but we're not working on it. That's oh, I mean. see. Well, I can think of a lot of other places I would rather hang around in a high-voltage <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> well, thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Woke. And now, Portland? Miss Sylvia Lewis from Hollywood, California. Oh, good evening, Miss Lewis. Good uh, evening, Mr. Allen. May I ask you uh, work here? Are you uh, in business here in Hollywood, are you? Yes, I work as a secretary to motion picture people. 
uh, a private secretary, are you? Private secretary. Oh, I see. Just you're, you're just uh, one private secretary, huh? <laughs> you're not a, a chain store. I mean, you're not a company well, or anything. Well, as a matter like... of fact, almost. You... My partner Billy Tossig and I run a secretarial bureau, and we have a staff of people, oh, and I... we're all private secretaries to motion picture people. Oh, I... you're a wholesale secretary. Well, that's good. Tell me, what services do you give, Miss uh, Lewis? Well, we help them to find houses when they come here for the first time and tell them where to send the children to school and take dictation and work on manuscripts. Well, I mean, if, you're, if a person's coming out from New York, they send you a wire, and by, when they get here, they, uh, you have uh, supplied them with a house, a butler, cook, groceries, car, chauffeur, and everything, huh? That's right. You said it much better than I could. Well, uh, I, got, I caught the gist, and I thought I'd save 30 seconds. <laughs> But uh, tell me, if people come here, suppose I came here with a cat and you rented a house for me, could you arrange to have a mouse run through on the half hour? Give the cat a little workout? That would be easy. There are lots of them in Hollywood. Well, uh, oh, Miss Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, Portland. Mr. Jim Kelso from New York City. Uh, Mr. Kelso, may I ask your racket or... <laughs> I'm a movie actor, Mr. Allen. A movie actor, celluloid bait, are you? <laughs> Do you agree with Mr. Boyle's uh, 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 argument, Mr. Uh, Kelso, that horses have a longer life in pictures than, than actors? Do you agree with Mr. Boyle, who just said in his interview... Yes, I do. You do, really? <laughs> if you had it all over again, uh, to do all over, would you rather be a horse? Mr. <laughs> Much rather. You, you would, really? Well, that, uh, you could uh, give your agent hydrophobia. <laughs> well, that brings us to our question. Tonight, we consider a problem uh, that is causing grave concern in many of our cities throughout the country at the present time. It is the automobile driver. Now, as we know, an automobile doesn't become a party to an accident of its own accord. The automobile is driven to it. Driver's licenses are required. Driver's licenses are issued to applicants who pass physical and driving tests. Mental tests are not required. Now, our question tonight is, should motorists, in addition to passing eye tests, physical tests, and driving tests, be required to pass an intelligent test? Now, uh, how do you feel about the intelligence test, Mr. Wolf? Well, yes, I think uh, that might be a very good idea. Uh, very often, uh, problems arise that uh, are not purely mechanical and... Uh, you think a person, uh, uh, a person who would pass an intelligence test would be able to function quicker uh, to his own advantage and, and uh, with better results than a person who had not passed intelligence? Probably. Well, well, now, wait a minute. I don't know whether you're right or not. Now, tell me, don't you think that a healthy truck driver uh, would have better coordination than a neurotic college professor driving along under the same circumstances? <laughs> huh? Well, there's something on both sides. Now, you, you, you are for the intelligence test. Am no. I right? All right. Thank you, Mr. Wolk. And now, Miss Lewis, how do you feel about the intelligence oh, test? Oh, I'm absolutely opposed to it. You are opposed to it? Yes. Why, may I ask? Because... You think it will eliminate all women drivers? <laughs> Was that what exactly, yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's awful. I stole your laugh, Miss Lewis. I didn't know you were going to say that. I give you my word, I am not psychic. I didn't read your mind. Without my glasses, I can't read anything. Well, thank you. You are opposed to it. Only on that uh, ground? Mm -hmm. I think women are very intelligent, and therefore, uh, supposedly, they're bad drivers. Of course, I'm a very bad driver, so I'm inclined to well, think the rest judge, of them are. Well, you can't judge all women by your own driving proclivities, Miss Lewis. But you are against it. All right, Mr. Kelso, how do you feel about the intelligence test? I'm in favor of it also. You are also in favor of the intelligence test. You think yeah. we would have a, a better class of drivers rampant on the streets? Oh, yes. Of course, I don't know about the driving around here. Uh, I see people at the wheel as they go by. Apparently, they don't know whether they're driving a car or operating a surfboard. I mean, <laughs> I know that out here on Vine Street, hundreds of cars go up and down every day, and the street is as good as new. It shows the, shows the drivers are driving on a beam or something. <laughs> well, our little committee stands apparently two for the intelligence test and one against it. Our uh, committee has dozed off, and I, I uh, know that's right, two for and one against. 
I do feel confident, however, that our little conference tonight will have no immediate effect on the motorist situation around the country. <laughs> Something tells me, though, that if all car owners had to pass an intelligence test tonight, the only man driving a car tomorrow would be Einstein. <laughs> on this note of FOB futility, our forum adjourns, and thank you all for your kind cooperation. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Mary Max who are a little nervous. Uh, Harry didn't introduce the Mary Max. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the Mary Max over on your right. <laughs> this is their first trip to Hollywood, and I know you'll be glad to hear their version of Take Your Girlie to the Movies. Take your girlie to the movies if you can't think of at all. Gentlemen, in the words of the uh, immortal... Pardon me, monsieur, mais, uh, you are Fred Allen. Well, that would depend. Are you from the finance company, sir? Uh, fine, mais non, je suis... That is to say, I am the proprietor of the restaurant Chapeau Bruin. Chapeau Bruin? Oui. Is, uh, well, it's just another brown derby to me, brother. Now, look, I am not interested monsieur, in... Monsieur, your... I come to ask permission that at my restaurant... We may name after you a dish. Now, look, Harry, I'm only out in Hollywood less than a week, and they want to name a fish after me yet. Uh, <laughs> fish? No, 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 monsieur. Dish. And it is superb. Tender young breast of chicken, baked under glass with mushrooms covered with cream. This piece de resistance is served with the potatoes smashed and uh, green peas fresh from the garden. And you want to call that the Allen Bloom plate, eh? Oui. Well, it's all right with me. It sounds like quite a tempting tidbit, doesn't it, Harry? Yes, yeah, certainly does, Fred. But there's one important thing you ought to remember about that dish. Well, what's that? Well, all the foods in it are soft and creamy and well-cooked. Well, what about it? They taste good, don't they? Oh, certainly, Fred. But like so many of the foods we eat nowadays, you know, they deprive our gums of the exercise they need to keep them firm and healthy. As a result, gums often become soft and tender and more susceptible to trouble. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the biggest reasons for the steadily increasing popularity of Ipana toothpaste. For when used with massage, Ipana helps give our gums the stimulation they need for firmness and health. When you realize, in addition to that, that Ipana and massage also gives you cleaner, brighter teeth, then you can readily understand this outstanding tribute to its merits. In the 1940 National Survey, conducted among thousands of dentists all over America, it was found that twice as many dentists personally use Ipana as any other dental preparation, paste, powder, or liquid. In fact, more than the next three dentifrices combined. Well, ladies and gentlemen, make their choice your choice. Start now to use Ipana toothpaste. <laughs> Thank 
you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, what's left of the mighty Alan R. players. Tonight, these undernourished punchinellos present a hillbilly court drama called Self-Defense. Or the judge was a vegetarian, so he couldn't mete out justice. Overture, Peter. <laughs> His Honor, J. Jellard. Hey, Jim. Uh, order in the court. Order in the court. Order in, uh, you in the corner. Order in the court. First case, Sheriff. Yeah, first case is strolling troubadours. Charge is disturbing the peace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, uh, quiet, please. Order in the... Uh, what you been doing, boys? Well, uh, we was with Major Bowles' unit 207 and a half. 207 and a half, eh? Yeah, yeah passing through here, we fell out of the freight car. We've been singing in backyards working our way home. Well, Charge here says you boys was uh, disturbing the peace. Well, we was only singing, Judge. That ain't disturbing the peace. Well, that all depends, son. Let me hear the evidence. Court okay, will hear the Judge, evidence. okay. One, two, boys. You're the flower of my heart. Sweet and old Well, uh, what's your verdict, Judge? That's 30 days. <laughs> My records are twisted here. Next case. People versus the uh, holes is fun. Charge is murder. 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 Order in the court. Murder, ain't it, clerk? Eh, yeah, it ain't only murder, Jig. Charge says horse stealing, milk snatching, attempting to abscond with ten cents worth of onion tea, and concluding with indecent dressing. Well, Hosey's got all the earmarks of a one-man crime wave, Sheriff. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You concur, hey? Well, yes, sir. proceed and uh, proceed with the case. First witness. Copper Chase Boy, Rancid. Present, Jed. Uh, you Rancid paid, are you, boy? Yes, sir. Ain't noticeable from here. Your <laughs> occupation, Rancid? Oh, afternoons I play hooky, Jed. Yeah, yeah. What are you up to morning, Spraff? Morning's at Ken McCall's general store at Devon's Corners. Uh, what do you know? about uh, Hosey Spunk, the defendant. Well, Hosey come loping into Paul's store about sunup this morning. Acting uh, loco, was he? Yeah. He was only wearing night clothes, Jed. Uh, night clothes, a two-piecer, futuramas, or what you call them. <laughs> no, he was wearing a night shirt, one of them flower bag and symbols. Mm-hmm. It said Pillsbury on the back. Yeah, yeah. What's a man shopping for in his bed gear, son? Hosey was a hooping and hollering, Jed. Said he had to have ten cents worth of onion peel in a hurry. Yeah? Where was Hosey burnt? He said I was too young to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Claimed he just rid 20 miles on horseback. I could take it up from there. Well, did you, you catch on, Rancid? <laughs> I know he was spying scorch, Jed. I let out a woohoo and the sheriff comes tearing in. Yeah, stand down, son. Help him down, Sheriff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was like Ranch and Sand Gage. I'd come streaking in and Hosey was there looking like low man in a strip poker game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, give him a taste of the law, did you? Yeah, I certainly did. Pulled my gun and I says, Look at here. Hosey Spunk, you're going to the clink. Yeah, locked him up, eh? Yep, yep. Hosey yeah, yeah. kept dancing in his cell, yelling for onion team. Yell for anything else, did he? Just food, Jig. Lord, I ain't never seen a man so hungry in all of my born days. He was snapping at the gravy matting in my whiskers. Hey, wow. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Stomach must have been as empty as a politician's hat when he's got it on, Sheriff. Yes, sir. He had 15 hamburgers, cellophane and all. He was eating like an acid. Lord, prisoner that hungry to eat the town into a higher tax rate. Yes, I was fixing to turn him loose, Judge, but just before noon, I got word that Ruth Tully had been found dead, so I held Hosey for murder. Ruth Tully? What was Ruth to Hosey? Hosey was Ruth's hired man. Oh. Yeah, sure, they run a small truck farm together. Well, this is getting gripping, Sheriff, but you <laughs> you ain't proved nothing. Yeah, wait a minute uh, now. I'm, I'm closing in on him, Jim. Well, don't seem like low men eating ten cents worth of ungentine and a gross of hamburgers to have time to stop for killing, Sheriff. Uh, my next witness will show the connection. Well, we'll see. Okie beep dokie. Mrs. Watson, take the stand, Mrs. I'm Watson. I'm coming, Jess, and I'm telling you I'm a wreck. Well, you're starting off telling the truth. <laughs> what, uh, what happened? 
Well, uh, my husband and me has the next farm to roof and hose in. You have the next farm, eh? Yeah. Uh, what do you know about this murder, Mrs. Uh, Watson? Well, just for daybreak, I was out milking the cow. Yeah. Uh-huh. I heard a shot come from over by Hosey's house. You run over to investigate, did you? No, I was milking, Jed. I had my hands full. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and two left over. Well, what, uh, what happened? What happened after the shot? Well, Hosey comes sprinting out of the house in his nightshirt. Yeah? He leaped the fence and come running up to me. You holler, did you? No, I was feeling kind of coy. Uh. <laughs> I says, folks can catch cold going out with no hats on, Mr. Spong. <laughs> <laughs> You're a card. we will have you over sometime. Well, what, uh... What did he say to that? Nothing, Jed. Hosey was all excited. He climbed under my cow and drained her in four swallows. <laughs> Wipe his mouth with her tail, did he? Nope. Dried his lips on her flank. Eh, well, then what? Well, without so much as a good day to you, Mrs. Watson, Hosey jumped on my husband's horse and galloped off towards town. You followed, did you? Not me, Jed. He was riding like the wind. Lord, the back of that nightshirt was sticking out like a dashboard, Jed. For sakes of my day. Long about then, my husband Hank come running out. He seen the man riding out the yard in his nightshirt, and he, he fired two shots at him. Then? Then he fired two shots at me. Well, I hid in a churn till Hank cooled off. Uh, then, after I scraped the butter off me, I told him the facts. I see. Well, stand down. Well, he didn't you. Leave I know. Stand far, down, but... Mrs. Watson. I... Hank Watson? Yes, yes. This yarn gospel, your wife here, here in that shop? Yep, I went over to Ruth's to check up on it, and sure enough, Ruth was deader than a bull at a barbecue. Now, assuming Hosey done the shooting, what would be his motive, Hank? Well, as far as money, Judge, them two was as poor as Richard Jelvenak. Well, they run a farm, didn't they? Well, they couldn't raise nothing but weeds, Judge. Crows was flying over the place with their claws over their eyes. Couldn't stand to look at it. Didn't they have no cattle? Yeah, uh, some cattle. They used to have a cow, but it got so bony it looked like a Venetian blind with skin on it. No horse? The horse got so weak he couldn't stand on its legs. Used to creep around the field on his stomach. You never heard no words between Roof and Hosey? No, no, no. They just used to work around, looking like any minute they was expecting a buzzard to tap them on the shoulder and say, you're next, brother. Well, stand down. Stand down, Hank. I don't think... I know. Stand brother. down. Oh, right. Don't care what you think, for the Lord. Hose his funk. Take the witness chair. Stand there. I can't sit down, Jed. That's right. In all excitement, you never did get that ungentine, did you? Nope. Still feel like I'm wearing a forest fire for pants, Jade. <laughs> guilty or not guilty, Jose? Uh, guilty with an alibi, Jade. You killed Roof Tully, did you? It was self-defense, Jade. Looks like you defended yourself permanent for Roof's concern. Well, it was me or him, Jade. I had to shoot him. Eh? Yeah, what happened? That's a long story. Court will take a synopsis, Jose. Okay. Eight years ago, I hired out to work for Roof. I was to get ten dollars a month and pounds. Ten dollars and pounds? Yep. If Roof found ten dollars, I was to get it. Proceed. <laughs> well, the first year I worked for Roof, he didn't pay me. But I was new there, so I let it slide. Second year? <laughs> and things got worse. Roof gave me the farm. He started working for me. How'd that work out? I couldn't pay him. So the following year, Roof took the farm back. <laughs> Everything we touched turned to weeds. Why aren't you growing nothing? Just growing old, Jeff. <laughs> well, how'd you live? And that's what started all the fussing. One day we was eating weeds. Weeds? Yep. <laughs> used to close our eyes and make out they was broccoli. Jeepers. <laughs> Jeepers creepers. Now you'd say, what's in that if you ate them, Judge? Well, one day we was trying to down the weeds and Rope spoke up. Uh, indigestion or was it words? Yep, it was words. Words, eh? Huh? Rope says, I ain't no vegetarian, I gotta have meat. I says, where are you going to find me? Nice coming back. Uh, well, Roof says, I'm going to kill the cow. And he did. Then you had meat, eh? On the horns, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> the rest of the cow was pretty bony. Yeah. You put that on the side of the plate, eh? Uh, right uh, yeah, 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 After yeah. Roof got a taste of meat, he calmed down for a week. And then I seen a strange look in his eyes. What sort of a look? It was a meat look, Jed. <laughs> a meat look, eh? Yeah, yeah. Soon as he got it, Roof went out and killed the hen. 
The next time Roof had that look, the horse disappeared. You two aren't eating horse meat. Well, Roof took an oath it was bear, but I knowed it was horse. Well, how could you tell? Well, after I had three or four meals of that bear meat, I started whinnying and wearing harness for underwear. <laughs> what happened when you finished the horse? Well, Roof was fine. And then one day he got that meat look again, Judge. And our dog disappeared. Roof didn't barbecue no mongrel. Now, he told me it was a woodchuck. But the next day, sure enough, I started chasing cats and burying bones. So when was that? Two weeks ago. Roof was good again for a time, and then I seen he was getting nervous. You didn't have no animals left, did you? No, Judge. Roof kept getting worse and worse. Last night we had brambles, and he wouldn't touch an area of thorn. You didn't say nothing? No. Nope. When I went to bed, Roof was pacing the floor. Yeah, yeah. This morning I heard a noise. I woke up. And there was Roof, Judge. Doing what? He had that meat look in his eyes. He was coming at me with a bottle of ketchup and a salt cellar. So I upped my gun and let him have it. That's your story, Jose? Yep, Judge. What's your verdict? There's an old cannibal saying, Jose. It goes, one man's meat is another man's brother-in-law. If you hadn't shot, you'd be a pot roast today. Court finds you not guilty. Court's adjourned. <laughs> time of year, ladies and gentlemen, when graduating classes concern themselves with such pertinent issues as who is the best student or the finest athlete and so forth. And so tonight we follow through with our own elections. And after a careful count, we are very happy to report as follows. First, the one most likely to succeed. I cannot toothpaste. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that is the natural choice. I cannot toothpaste when used with gum massage will succeed in helping you have the kind of a smile you can be proud of. Because an attractive smile depends on sparkling teeth and firm, healthy gums. And Ipana toothpaste is especially made not only to clean and brighten teeth, but when used with massage, to help give gums the stimulation they need for firmness and health. Second, the most convincing speaker. That, too, is Ipana toothpaste. For Ipana definitely speaks for itself. The very first time you brush your teeth with Ipana... Massage a little extra eye panel on your gums and notice the remarkable difference. Notice that pleasant tingling sensation as circulation speeds up and lazy gums start to waken. Finally, the most popular member of the class. And again, the winner is eye panel toothpaste. For so many people step up to their drug counters and ask for eye panel that it has become the largest selling toothpaste in America. Make up your mind right now to stop at your drugstore for an economical tube of eye panel and help yourself to healthier gums brighter teeth, and the kind of a smile that wins friends and keeps them with Ipana toothpaste. Well, another hour seems to have slipped away to add its little mite to eternity, ladies and gentlemen. But don't forget, next Wednesday night we bring you Vacation Hints. How can I avoid a touch of the sun? Ask him for two bucks first. Oh. Your song of the week. Oh, McDonald had a tourist camp. Hey, 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 oh, hey, oh, 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 just a minute. Uh, 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 Nelson, just a minute, Nelson. That old McDonald had a farm, isn't it? <laughs> you wouldn't know the old place now, brother. <laughs> and our guest will be... Radio's highest paid stooge. Here, Phil Harris, the straight man, Jack Benny. If you miss Jack Benny Sunday night, tune in next Wednesday night. Miss... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there isn't one of us who hasn't a very deep sympathy for the unfortunate people of Europe, the old men, women, and little children who are today in such desperate need. I know that all of us want to help, to do our share. And we can help by giving to the American Red Cross. Thankful that we are able to give. Grateful that we're living in a country where we can answer this call for assistance. We live the American way. Let's give the American way. Thank you, and good night, ladies and gentlemen.
Can't rest me off. It's from Louisiana, Berkeley. This is the National Broadcasting Company.